Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 66 of the Tick Bootcamp podcast. The title of today's interview is Writing Out Line, an interview with Brandy Dean. My name is Richard Johannesson. And I'm Matt Sabatello. Today's podcast guest is Brandy Dean. Brandy Dean is the founder and president of Ride Out Lyme and a founder and advisory member of the Dean Center for Tick-Borne Illness. In 2010, Brandy Dean began to experience the symptoms of a tick disease. She had just finished a four-year tour in the United States Coast Guard, and she was in her second trimester of her pregnancy. In July of 2011, the severity of her symptoms began to interfere with every aspect of her life. She had vertigo, severe panic attacks, and heart palpitations. At its worst, Brandy Dean would have to take her son to school in a taxi because she was unable to drive. She was diagnosed with Lyme disease after seeing a dozen doctors and was on oral antibiotics for years. Then in 2016, Brandy Dean was bitten for a second time and developed psychosis and went into a dark depression, during which she was bedbound for months. Brandy went to Germany to receive hypothermia treatment and maintains the benefits of that treatment through clean eating, rest, prevention, and low-dose antibiotics when needed. Hey, Brandy Dean, and welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. So, Brandy, can you share with our listeners a little about your background? And, and we're particularly interested in, well, much of your background, but particularly interested in your time when you served in the military. Sure. So I joined the military after living in Manhattan for a couple of years. I walked into a recruiting station on Wall Street. So I joined the United States Coast Guard in 2003. And from there, I did search and rescue and law enforcement on a cutter off the coast of Cape Cod for two years and then worked in Boston for two years. Could you share with our listeners what your educational background is? Sure. I went to Boston University, I got a degree in business management, and I used to work in hospitality. I was an event planner, a general manager for several hotels um, until I joined the Coast Guard. And because tick diseases are family diseases, we always ask our guests to share with us what your family situation is. Sure. So I'm married. I have two young boys. They're 11 years old and eight. Can you share with us when you began to exhibit the symptoms of a tick disease? Sure. So I was pregnant with my second son. I was in my second trimester. And I noticed when I was putting my uh, two-year-old to bed, I just had this feeling like I was that gravity was pulling me over. It was kind of this weird sensation. And it, over the course of a few weeks, got worse. Then I started having heart palpitations and just felt a little off. And this definitely felt like very different to my first pregnancy. So I'd gone to the doctor and they had suggested that it was probably just hormones. And then it wasn't until my son was born in February 2011 that I was experiencing really strong heart palpitations. I had intermittent hearing loss and my health from there just kind of declined significantly. I had vertigo that would come and go and wasn't until June, I think it was actually July of 2011, I was driving in the car with my husband and the right side of my body went numb and I felt disoriented and my heart was racing. And I said, I think you need to bring me to the emergency room. Like I thought I was having a stroke. So he brought me to the emergency room and that's where they had done a bunch of tests. And they actually asked me, I forgot to mention this, when I was in the emergency room in July, 2011, they asked me if I had been bitten by a tick. And I recalled being bitten by something back in October of 2010 and it had bruised, but it didn't look like the typical bullseye rash that I'd seen in the news. So I didn't really worry about it until that visit to the ER. And that's why they tested me for Lyme disease. Do you recall ever having bitten by a tick prior to your symptoms de developing? No, no. I remember getting bitten by a bug and I only saw the bruise. So I assumed I was bitten by a bug back in October. What did you know about ticks and tick diseases prior to your symptoms developing? So that's a really good question. I remember seeing it on the news for the first time uh, when they were talking about uh, that they had discovered this illness in children in Lyme, Connecticut. And I had always assumed that you took antibiotics and got better. And it wasn't until I got really sick and after doing research that I realized that people were having ongoing symptoms. 
Did you know anyone personally who had Lyme disease or a tick disease prior to your symptoms beginning to develop? No, I didn't. Brady, when you were in the hospital, did the doctors run a Lyme disease test when you went to the ER? They did. I was very lucky because I know a lot of people go and are not offered the test. And we're in a highly endemic area. And I didn't know that at the time. But I, you know, I think the fact that I recalled that bug bite back in October kind of raised a red flag for them. And they were great. They actually ordered the test. However, (laughs) it did come back positive. They gave me antibiotics. But when I went to my primary care physician a week later, he suggested that I didn't even have Lyme disease, that the test was false positive because I had all these neurological symptoms and I didn't have the flu-like achy joints and muscles that were indicative of Lyme disease. So he suggested that I stop taking the antibiotics. How was this impacting your capacity to parent your children? Uh, It was extremely difficult. I remember, so Finn at that time was probably four or five months old. So I was still learning to deal with a newborn and a two-year-old. And I, you know, I remember taking them both in my arms and scooting down our stairs in the the brownstone that we lived in Boston, and then just putting them in front of the TV and laying down and just sobbing. It was, it was horrible. No one knew what was going on with me. I thought I was dying because I'd never felt so sick before. And, you know, I was used to, you know, when you come down with the flu, you're sick for a couple of weeks and then you get better, but I wasn't getting better. So I was really frightened that one day my children were, were going to wake up without a mother. So it was very hard. How was the developing symptoms impacting you socially? Before I got sick, I spent a lot of time with friends, going out, having dinner with them, going out with my husband. I was very active too. And I just felt very isolated because I wasn't able to go out. I, you know, I would try to take my kids to the park around the corner, but I got very overstimulated very easily. I just felt like I was going to faint. So I feel like, you know, my husband during that time didn't really understand what was going on with me and suggested, well, maybe you're just having a hard time dealing with two small children, like, because my doctors were saying the same thing. So it was really hard. I felt very alone during that time. Did you have any question in your mind about whether or not these developing symptoms had something to do with your new parenting or it was something else? No, I mean, every time I went to the doctors, I, and I went a lot, I went to the emergency room a lot because I had these frightening symptoms I had never experienced before. I always said, I have dealt with stress before. I was in the Coast Guard. We were doing search and rescue in 30 foot seas. Like, I dealt with stress and I've never, ever had symptoms like this. I was very healthy. I worked out. I did yoga until I was 39 weeks pregnant. So I knew that there was something wrong with me. I knew that I was very sick and it was terrifying to think that everyone around me thought I was making it up. Were there people in your life who you were close to who questioned whether or not you were really sick? Yeah, there were quite a few people in the beginning when I was first diagnosed that questioned whether or not I was really sick because, you know, my doctors, they had all diagnosed me with anxiety. So I think everyone assumed because I was a new mother and taking care of these young children and I dealt with anxiety in the past that, you know, it must be, it must be that. And I looked well. That was the other thing. I didn't look sick. So, Brandy, you were fighting for about eight months to figure out what was wrong with you, and the ER mm-hmm. doctor finally said you had a positive Lyme test. Yeah. How long was the prescription for, for the doxycycline that he prescribed you? So it was two weeks. Looking back, do you think two weeks was adequate, considering that the Lyme was now in your heart and really was deep in your body? Absolutely not, no. And I, I often tell people who are bitten or have a rash to ask their doctors for six to eight weeks of antibiotics and to get tested for other co-infections other than Lyme disease. So how did you feel when you first got this diagnosis from the ER doctor? Were you relieved that you finally had an answer to your problems? I was relieved until I called my brother and I said, I just found out I have Lyme disease. I'm on antibiotics. Now I know what's going on with me. And he had mentioned that he had a teacher in high school that had Lyme disease and ended up in a wheelchair. And that's when I 
got really nervous because I just assumed that this was like a flu-like illness that got better after antibiotics. And when he mentioned that, I realized that it was more complicated than that. And, you know, a week later when I went off the antibiotics, I got really sick. Brandy, when you followed up with your primary care physician and they said that you don't have Lyme and it was a false positive, did you believe the doctor? Were you conflicted? How did you feel at that point? I was conflicted at that point, and I remember leaving there, and I, I thought, okay, well, maybe it's something else. And he had sent me to a few specialists at a well-known hospital in Boston, so I went to a neurologist and a psychiatrist and an ear, nose, and throat doctor, and I had vestibular rehab therapy. And so I thought, okay, I'll try all of these things, but nothing ever added up, and It wasn't until I had my second Lyme test and the Western blot came back positive. That was in September. And that's when I thought, gosh, you know, maybe I do have Lyme. And I started doing some more research and found several people online that were struggling with debilitating symptoms after having treatment. And some people were on long-term antibiotics. And that's when I realized that I needed to see someone to figure this all out. Did the two positive Lyme tests help you to deal with some of the doubters in your life? No. <laughs> I wish they had. Gosh, when I think back to that time, it's, it's so hard. Even with two positive Lyme tests, like people did not believe me. And, you know, when I brought my second test back to my primary care physician, I said, look, I tested positive again from LabCorp a lab that Mass General Hospital uses. And he said, no, it's not Lyme brandy. I bet it's a viral infection causing you to test positive for Lyme. So even with the positive test, that didn't mean anything to anyone except me until I saw an infectious disease specialist in December. Brandy, can you share with us if you were feeling judged by the people in your life who did not believe that you were as sick as you were? I did. And how did that make you feel? How did the judgment make you feel? I was incredibly frustrated, and I say this over and over again, I was scared because I was feeling so sick that I thought I was going to die, and I was afraid that no one would figure out what's wrong with me until I died. Like, it was was really hard. It was really hard during that time to have people that I love that didn't didn't believe me, and they're all, everyone is so supportive now. They get it, but back then, I just felt so alone. Brandy, at what point did you finally find a doctor that believed your two positive Lyme tests and treated you for the Lyme disease that was the root cause of your symptoms? So I was lucky. It was December of 2010 that I saw an infectious disease specialist, not a Lyme literate doctor, who was recommended by a friend of mine. And when I sat down with her, I explained my experience with the Coast Guard and how active I was, I remember, you know, just sobbing in her office because I had seen so many doctors that really just assumed I was struggling with anxiety. And she spent a little over an hour with me, but I think within the first 20 minutes, she stopped me and she said, listen, I just want to let you know, I think that there is something wrong, that uh, you are sick and we're going to figure it out. She tested me again for Lyme and she called me up a week later and said, your Western blot is lit up like a Christmas tree. You need help. And that was the third time you had a positive Lyme test. Yeah. So now that your new infectious disease doctor had a third positive Lyme test, very high, what was your new treatment course with this doctor? So she treated me with 31 days of IV antibiotics. And I have to say within the first two days, the vertigo went away, the severe anxiety and panic went away. And I, I think it was week two that I went to the gym for the first time and walked on the treadmill for two minutes. So I felt like I was getting better. And then unfortunately, you know, she at that time only treated with 31 days of IV antibiotics. So when the treatment stopped, some of my symptoms came back, not nearly as severe. And during that time, I had done some more research and found a Lyme literate doctor in our area. And I've been with her ever since, which she treated me with oral antibiotics. So that was in 2012. And I, you know, I, I, I never fully recovered, but I got to the point where I was, you know, it took about a year and a half where I was finally like 
running again and exercising and taking boot camp style classes. And so from 2013 to 2016, I was feeling pretty good, still struggling with symptoms, but able to exercise and, and spend more time with my kids. Brandy, did you believe that was because of the follow-up with your Lyme litter doctor, that the one month of IV antibiotics wasn't sufficient and you needed that follow-up course of oral antibiotics long-term? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. So you recovered so much where you were exercising, you were working, and you almost had your life completely back. Yeah. And all of this sort of kind of leveled out up until 2016, it sounds like, when you had another health-related incident, right? Yeah. So it was, I think, in April or May of 2016, a group of us had signed up for a Spartan race that was supposed to take place in November. So we were having like these training sessions. So I was really excited about that, feeling really good. It was during that time that I had gone to a soccer game. And I remember pulling something off the back of my neck and it was black and I didn't think anything of it because I was on a maintenance dose of doxycycline at the time. So I thought, well, if it's a tick, I won't get sick. And it was just a few weeks later, I was at my son's soccer game, another game, and I felt really faint. And they had to get the ENT out and they took me out on a golf cart and my friend drove me home. And then it was a few days after that, I came down with the summer flu. And I still wasn't convinced that I, you know, had gotten Lyme or anything else. I went to the emergency room in Wellesley and they said, you know, it's very rare for people to get the flu in the summertime. So we're going to test you for Lyme and babesiosis. I believe those tests came back negative and I was still seeing my Lyme Leonard doctor and she did some more tests, follow-up tests. And I actually had two bands on the Western blot that had never been positive before that were now positive. And now I had the flu-like symptoms, achy joints and muscles and fever. I knew it was most likely a new infection because in the past, when, it, when I was diagnosed in 2010, I had all the neurological symptoms from Lyme disease. So she, she put me on IV antibiotics, but I'll tell you, that was the sickest I had ever been. I dealt with psychosis. I had anaphylactic reaction to foods. I was in a really, really, really dark place because I had overcome years of feeling horrible and then to get sick again like that. I just, I had lost all hope that I was going to get better again. Brady, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry you had that second experience, and, and I'd like to explore that with you a little bit more if we could. The first thing that I, I'd like to ask you is, you didn't find a tick the first time you had been bitten, but you did find a tick the second time. Did you change your behavior between your first tick bite experience and your second tick bite experience, which allowed you to discover the tick? Oh, yes, definitely. After my first diagnosis, I did tick checks every day. We are sprayed head to toe with permethrin and tick repellent. And I don't sit in the grass. My kids don't sit in the grass. So I became highly vigilant after my first diagnosis. The thing that's kind of odd for me, though, is that I knew that I thought I had pulled a tick off my neck. But I assumed that since I was on doxycycline at the time, that I would be okay. And that just wasn't the case. So because you changed your behavior, you did discover yeah. tick, but I guess your compromised immune system didn't allow you to defend uh, against right. the, the second tick bite, despite being on the doxy. Right. Yep. Could you also share with us what types of, of changes you made in parenting, specifically uh, what steps did you take to protect your children from coming in contact with ticks? A couple of years ago, my friend had called, my youngest son, Finn, had gone over to their house and she had raked up this huge pile of leaves for them to jump into. And I had no idea. I came to pick them up and she said, Brandy, I am so sorry, but Finn was so great. He told me he's not allowed to jump in leaves. And my son was like, oh, you're not allowed to jump in leaves. Why? <laughs> and he said, because of all the ticks. So I spent a lot of time with my kids just educating them on where ticks are. You know, when they go to soccer, they don't sit in the grass. They sit on their ball if they have to, or they stand. We take showers every single night after sports. We do tick checks. Mm -hmm. They know they can't go out unless I spray their shoes with permethrin and sometimes their clothes. 
but they're always wearing tick repellent. I always make fun of us because you can smell us a mile away. <laughs> so my kids are very knowledgeable and they have recently have had people that they know that have become very sick with Lyme. Brandy, we spoke a little bit about the doubters in your life. How did that begin to change? You, you've indicated now that the people in your life are very supportive of you. How did that transformation in the way you were treated by those people occur? I think a few things happened. When we opened the Dean Center, they were introduced to people that were very sick and who struggled for many years uh, living with debilitating symptoms. And many of my friends now have friends who are struggling with daily symptoms from Lyme, Bartonella, babesiosis, and have had issues finding someone to diagnose them, to treat them. And now that we have all these celebrities that are coming out and sharing their stories, I think people really get it now. At least most of my friends and family members, my doctors are still not on board, but <laughs> everyone else understands how debilitating this illness is um, and how hard it is to get a diagnosis. You mentioned the Dean Center, which we're going to ask you if you could join us for a separate podcast that just discuss that part of your journey. But because you mentioned it, I would ask you to please just give a brief description of the Dean Center and what your vision was for the founding of the Dean Center. Sure. So we joined hands with Spalding Rehab Hospital in Charlestown in 2014. So the Dean Center is the first center within an academic medical institution focused on long-term and affordable care for patients living with chronic tick-borne disease. And we decided to fund this project because when I was sick, it was so hard to find a center within Boston that was willing to treat me. So I felt completely ignored by the medical establishment. And the Dean Center has been wonderful in that it takes in patients who are dealing with chronic symptoms due to tick-borne illness. Brandy, so you were still on the doxycycline from your Lyme litter doctor from your first infection when you got bit and got infected again a second time, but yet you still got sick. So why yeah. do you think you got sick while on doxycycline? You know, I think my immune system is compromised from the first infection. I, you know, I was still dealing with symptoms and I was on a very low dose of doxycycline during that time. So I think that's probably why I got really sick again. And also, you know, there's so many different strains of Borrelia and there's Bartonella and Babesia. And I know doxycycline is not the medication of choice for all of those infections. So it could be a number of reasons. I'm not really sure. And what new antibiotics did your Lyme litter doctor put you on to now combat the new infection mm -hmm. of Lyme disease? And you also had at this point, I believe, Bartonella and Babesia as well, right? Yeah, that's correct. So I was on IV rosafin, IV clindamycin. I went on rivampin. I tried the daptomycin protocol by Ying Zhang. So I went on a number of different IV antibiotics for a year. And Brandy, what led you from all of these varying antibiotic treatments to Germany, where you ultimately ended up to go to the Clinic St. George in Germany for hyperthermia treatment? So I got better on the IV antibiotics, but I was still unable to drive long distances and I still felt very sick. So I probably was functioning at around 60% before I went to the St. George Clinic. And I was still struggling with this really dark depression that I'd never felt before. So I spoke to several people who had gone to the clinic and who improved significantly and did a lot of research and met with a doctor from the St. George Clinic and finally decided that I would go. So I went in July and August of 2017. What were your feelings? I mean, it must have been a scary thought to travel to Germany for this, what we call here in the States, experimental treatment that may yep. or may not be beneficial to heal you. Right. So I remember years before that, I'd heard of people going to this clinic and I said, there's no way I will ever have that. That treatment's way too aggressive for me. But I, you know, I tried everything and all I wanted to do was be there for my children, to go to their games, to 
watched them participate in life and I was barely functioning. So I felt like I didn't have a choice. I also had spoken to several people who were doing really well after the treatment. So I asked a family member to go with me and the night before I almost canceled. I said, there's no way I can do this, but we went through with it. And it's honestly the best thing I ever did because when I got back, I was exercising again and I was able to drive my kids around to their sports and I felt so much better. I was actually symptom free for seven months and felt amazing. So Brandy, we've had several other guests who have had hyperthermia and they've had varying experiences. So what was it like waking up from the hyperthermia treatment? So for me, the first thing I noticed is my head. I had clarity for the first time in seven years and I was really tired. And then the next morning, my aunt and I went for a long walk. And that following weekend, we went to Austria and walked up this really steep hill up to the castle in Salzburg. And I wasn't able to do stuff like that before. And it was hard. It was very difficult because it is such, the therapy itself is very intense. It's hard to be away from your family. You're in a different country. But if it wasn't for my aunt, I don't know if I would have gone through with my second hyperthermia treatment. And I did. And I always tell people, I get a lot of calls from people who are thinking about going to the clinic. It's very expensive. And I always tell people, I don't think it's a cure. It helped me, but I, you know, there are several people that have gone that have had no improvements and I'm not really sure why. Would I go back again? Yes, definitely. But it's definitely a choice that you have to make for yourself. So Brandy, from what I understand, the hyperthermia is effectively heating your body up to a temperature that Lyme can't survive in, and they pump antibiotics into you while you're in this medically induced sort of uh, sleeping state, and the Lyme bacteria will be killed off. However, it doesn't kill off some of the co-infections. Is that correct? So that's correct. So for me, during that time, I uh, was clinically diagnosed for Bartonella and Babesia. I actually had a positive test for Babesia duncani. And my Babesia and Bartonella symptoms, I believe they went dormant during the seven months that I was symptom-free. I'm not really sure because I was not experiencing any symptoms whatsoever. It was the first time in a long time that I had felt normal again. And you mentioned that you went back a second time for hyperthermia. So did you return to Germany at a later point for a follow-up therapy of the hyperthermia? Oh, no. So I had two hyperthermia treatments within the two weeks that I was there. Is that standard protocol to do two different treatments while you're there? Yeah. Yeah. How are you feeling today? Now let's fast forward to where you are today. I mean, you sound great. You look great from your Instagram. You're doing such great work in the Lyme community. Uh, I was doing great up until June. And the thing about this illness is you have to manage your life differently. And when I say that, i very busy with Ride Out Lyme and events with the Dean Center. And, you know, I've come to realize I can't have my hands in everything anymore because stress, lack of sleep, travel, all of those things cause me to have really bad symptoms. Since June, I've been feeling kind of run down, like I have the flu. And so now I'm trying to figure out what is next for me. I think I may work with someone to help build up my immune system and work on my diet and see if that helps. But I definitely have been feeling the effects of all the hard work we did in in the beginning of the year. And I'm struggling with all the Lyme symptoms again, the brain fog. And so it's tough, but, you know, we'll figure it out. So Brandy, do you believe that the Lyme bacteria is still back and now making you sick? Or do you believe this is just the, you know, the remaining co-infections that were sort of dormant and a weak immune system causing you current symptoms? That's a good question. I don't know. I do think that, you know, I still test positive for Lyme, even on a urine test recently from Cirrus Labs. And I believe that test actually tests the antigen, the Lyme antigen. So I'm still, I I still come up positive for Lyme. I do believe that I'm struggling with an underlying infection. What that is, I'm not really sure. And, you know, a compromised immune system. Brandy, you've been on on some some unbelievable journey, and and as a consequence of going on this journey, you've clearly changed. Can you share with our listeners how this has changed you 
physically, how this has changed you spiritually, how this has changed you emotionally, and what kinds of things have you done as a consequence of this transformation that you've gone through? So I'll tell you about the good things that have happened, because I think that's so important, because living with chronic illness is really hard. You lose a lot of friends, and I still feel sometimes different because I'm not able to stay out as late. You know, I'm always the first one to leave a party or a dinner. But, you know, the one thing that has happened is this community is such a supportive, compassionate group of people. I feel like I've made so many friends that I can reach out to when I'm having a difficult day. And these people have lifted me up every single day. And there are people out there that are just struggling, that are sicker than I am right now and are still helping others, you know, by raising awareness and educating others and helping people find resources. And it's just incredible. And I'm inspired by this community every single day. The other thing is my kids are the most compassionate boys you'll ever meet because they've seen me when I was very sick. And we always talk about turning our our pain into passion. And, you know, we've overcome this as a family by opening up the Dean Center, by fundraising for other nonprofit events to help people. And that's been so nice to see. However, there's, you know, there isn't a day that goes by, there isn't a second that goes by that I'm not thinking about my health and preparing for the next day or the next hour, or if I have an event, I have to make sure that I have nothing planned the week before, that I'm resting, that I'm napping, that I'm going to bed early. And I constantly worry about my kids because I can't imagine watching my children go through what I went through. We are again going to invite you for a separate podcast to talk about the brilliant work and the generous work you're doing uh, with Write Out Lime. But you did describe a little bit about Write Out Lime during the earlier portion of your answer. So can you share very briefly what you're doing with Write Out Lime and how that became a passion of yours? Yeah, so Write Out Lime is now a nationally recognized charity ride event. We collaborate with SoulCycle to raise funds for grants for adults in need of financial assistance for their treatments, and we, we will start taking applications in the beginning of the year 2020. So this started after a friend brought me to SoulCycle in 2013, 2014, and it was my first thin cycle class I'd taken since I had been sick. And I was so inspired by the instructor that day and the class and the people. And I thought, gosh, it'd be great to like bring our community together in this space to raise funds for people in need. And, you know, it's great to see people that have been struggling with Lyme that are feeling well enough to just sit on a bike and pedal slowly in the back and they bring their friends and they feel supported and we will be in several cities next year doing it again. When is the next event that you're going to be hosting with the Ride Out Lime? So we have several. We have Ride Out Lime Ski and Snowboard collaborating with Sam Spoons. That will be in March. And we're going to be collaborating with Bay Area Lime Foundation in California. We'll be in La Jolla, Manhattan Beach, and Palo Alto for Ride Out Lime California. That's the first weekend in March. This is all on our website. And our last two rides are in Boston and New York City. I don't know how anyone wouldn't be exhausted after doing all <laughs> that you're doing, regardless of Lyme or not. We, we do have one last question for you before we, again, beg you to come back so that we can discuss <laughs> both your, your work with the Dean Center and uh, Ride Out Lime. But I, I do have one last question that we ask every guest. And we started to touch on this with you a little bit earlier, but I'm going to ask it again. If, God forbid, tomorrow morning you woke up, and you found that you had a tick biting you on your arm, what would you do? Well, I just read your tick blueprint on your website, and I think it's amazing. And I'm going to start sending that link to everyone because it has all the information that I would give someone. One, save the tick, send it off for testing, treat the bite. I always say treat the bite because you just never know that the tests out there are not that accurate. And just continue to watch for symptoms after treatment. And hopefully that never happens. Thank you for listening to the Tick Bootcamp interview with Brandy Dean. To our listeners, we have a call to action. First, if you'd like to learn more about Brandy Dean and her tick disease journey, please visit her Instagram at RouteOutLine. Second, if you enjoyed this episode of the Tick Bootcamp podcast, please share it with your friends by using the social media buttons you see at the bottom of the post. 
Third, we here at Tick Bootcamp have created a Tick Byte blueprint that has been inspired by the information that has been shared with us by past podcast guests. We urge you to visit our website at www.tickbootcamp.com to view the blueprint. We would appreciate it if you would contact us with any suggestions you have for improvements. Fourth, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play Music, or Spotify to get the automatic episode updates of our Tick Bootcamp podcast. And finally, we thank you, our listeners, for your comments on our past podcast episodes. Please take a minute to leave us an honest review on iTunes, on Instagram, or on our website. We make it a point to read every single one of the reviews we get. Thank you for listening.